Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I'm back with one of my favourite videos to make at this time of year and one of my favourite videos to watch and that is my best books of the year so far video. So which books have really, really stayed with me, had an impact on me, imprinted on me. I was going to try and do 10, couldn't do it, then I was going to try and do 12 because that's one of my favourite numbers, couldn't do that went for 14 and then had three honourable mentions that I'm going to say are all at my joint 15th place. Now some people might say that's cheating, possibly because it is, but the three books that I'm going to talk about first shortly are books that I liked, however over time they've really 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 lingered and stayed with me and I keep thinking about them. One of them I haven't actually mentioned on the channel before, in fact there's a couple of books I haven't mentioned on the channel before, but because I have mentioned most of these on the channel before I'm going to try really hard to be quite succinct and give you kind of an overall view of what the book's about, my overall thoughts and yeah I obviously love them because they're in my top. 15, possibly 17. Also, just to mention, there is no non-fiction in this selection. I haven't read very much this year. I've read some absolute corkers though. I've got some, what I think will be absolute bangers lined up. So I'm hoping for November, when it's non-fiction November, I'll be able to see my favorite non-fiction of the year so far. That'll be exciting. Other things to mention are, I've only allowed myself one book by any author and I've not allowed myself any series. Uh, or books within a series. Now, there is one book that I do want to mention, so suddenly we've gone to 18, and that book is, and here I'm going to test if I can be really succinct, it's Kate Moss's The Ghost Ship. I mean, firstly, just look at the spreaders on that. I mean, that's wild and amazing. This is a pirate tale, lesbian love at sea, that also looks at gender and women's place in society in the historical time period of the 1600s. There we go. Loved it, loved the characters, loved everything it was trying to say, but also a proper rip-roaring adventure. And I don't normally love books set at sea or on boats, and I really, really, really enjoyed this. So there we have that one. Now, moving on to the three honourable mentions, two of them I have talked about because they were on the Women's Prize long list and one of them was shortlisted. The one that didn't get shortlisted, which was quite a shock, I think, to quite a lot of people, was Wandering Souls, which is about, well, a set of siblings within a family who head from Vietnam hoping to get to America. They don't end up in Thatcher's Britain. They also end up losing half of their family in real tragedy on one of those sea journeys. We follow on from there what it's like. We have one of the dead siblings talking to us, one of the wandering souls, but also the wandering souls of these three children having to start a new life somewhere that isn't particularly welcoming to them. I thought it was stunningly done. It made me cry a lot. There were a few bits where I was like, oh, that feels a bit more like journalism in sort of a nearer to the present day narrative, but I got the reason for that after I finished it and it has stayed with me. The wandering souls are still floating around me very much and yeah I think it was a great book and I look forward to whatever Cecile Pinn writes next as I do whatever Priscilla Morris writes next. Black Butterflies. It's really hard to talk about this book but this book is a book that is a book. So this book really 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 changed my perception of what war is like, both in the fact that as this book starts, Zora, who is our main character, is aware that things are not quite right in Sarajevo and things seem to be bubbling along to the point where her husband and her mother head to England where they have family um, and she says that she'll join them at some point. However, and one of the big points of this book was how quickly it can go from there being trouble bubbling along to suddenly war and suddenly everything changing when the place you live is war torn and the fact that you still have to try and live some kind of normality in completely abnormal circumstances. I thought this was so powerfully done. I will admit the bits on art I wasn't sure about but that's just because I really struggle with books on art. It's one of the things that I'm not so great with but that's me not the book. Also there was a love story in here that I thought was fascinating, really like made me have some questions around my own sort of morals, I guess, because it was a love that shouldn't have happened, but I was desperate for it to happen. And when it did happen, I was overjoyed. And I think it looks at love and how we love different people and how many people we can love in a really interesting way. Also really made me think about what's going on in Ukraine and the parallels of that would 
particularly haunting would be fascinated to see what she writes next and we'll read it when she does now the next honorable mention is and then he sang a lullaby by annie coyote sonta chukwu and this i haven't talked about yet on the channel i'll talk about it in more depth when i do my may june and july wrap up at the end of this month or beginning of next month this is a love story about two young gay men in nigeria at a time when well being gay is not easy in Nigeria, still isn't it in Nigeria, and at the time that this is set, the whole discussion around gay marriage is happening. It weirdly feels very historical because that seems like kind of a antiquated societal view. However, it is still happening in the world. We're not as far forward as we like to think we are, and we follow these two young men before they meet and then after they meet, one of whom is I guess you would say effeminate, gets bullied horrifically for it. I found that really hard to read. And then we have the other who is stereotypically what I guess you would say would be a heteronormative young man, really into sports. And it looks at those two scenarios and this book is heartbreaking, absolute heartbreaker, but I think incredibly powerful and important and I loved it. So those are the three honourable mentions that make my joint 15. I've cheated enough, I got 18 in. Let's get cracking with the official chart, as it were. At number 14, we have Brute. Brute is set in a small town in Florida where a young girl goes missing. A group of fellow youths are aware of what happened. They talk to us in a choral voice. I didn't think that would work. It absolutely does. And what I think is brilliant about this is both we have this choral voice where they're keeping you as the reader at a distance from what happened and won't tell you, but also we go ahead in time to when they're in their sort of mid to late 20s and find out what they're up to. And there were some elements of this that were so odd, so creepy, so spooky and supernatural. I wasn't 100% I wasn't 100% sure what was going on in this book, but I loved it regardless. It just had me, and I think it's because it was quite different. And I think the fact that there was all this sort of question mark and sort of grey about what might have happened that was real and or what was dreamed or was there some supernatural elements going on, absolutely brill. Can't wait to see what Diz Tate writes next. And number 13, and lucky for some, but not for me getting to read this book because I loved it, is Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson. And this tells of two siblings who haven't seen each other for a long time, Benny and Byron. And they are literally having their mother read her will and tell her story to them after her death. She has had quite the life and kept so much a secret from her children and through her we start in the Caribbean when she's a young girl, follow her to the reasons why she vanished and then find out what really happened to her and in doing so we go through the last sort of 80 years of what it's been like to be a black woman at pivotal points in history. It has got a slight girl woman other vibe if you like that I think you'd really enjoy this. This I would say is more plotty and has a lot more twists and turns, whereas I would say Girl and Other has surprises as you put the patchwork together, whereas this is very much like you get the story as you go. I love the way it looked at friendship, it looked at what it's like to be siblings, it looked at LGBTQIA plus people's lives in the Caribbean, and yeah, celebrates food. Really, really good. The black cake is very important. At number 12, we have The New Life by Tom Crew, which tells of two men in the late 1800s. John, who is a closeted homosexual, he's married with children, but he is having dalliances on the side. And actually, this book starts with one of the sexiest scenes I've ever read. It's set on a Victorian tube train, and I don't think I will ever forget it. I'm getting hot under the collar thinking about it right now. There's some real pure yearning and desire in this book, which is so beautifully written. And even though I'm living in a much more open 
time, the yearning in this reminded me of when I was coming to terms with my sexuality and starting to think about what shenanigans I might like to get up to. Not necessarily on tube train, just to clarify. It also looks at, I want to say Henry, I'm dreadful with names, it is Henry, who um, is also in a marriage of convenience. He has his own sexual preferences, which are quite unusual. The story of his wife is really, really interesting, and it's how these two men decide to write a book about homosexuality and sexuality, which causes quite a ruckus around the time of the Oscar Wilde case. There's also, Tom, if you see this, I would love you to write a novel about the two men who are living in the Peak District together, that, for me, I just like, I wanted so much more. I would love that to be a book in the future. Anyway, this was great. Look forward to what Tom Crew writes next. The first of two short story collections in at 11 is The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filial. On the back it says, this book explores the raw and tender places where black women and girls dare to follow their desires and pursue a momentary reprieve from being good. And it's so true and it's so delicious for that. There are some really difficult topics within all of the stories but what I think that um, Disha is so good at is balancing perfectly things that are tricky and difficult along with things that are salacious and sensual and sexy and saucy and a bit naughty and there's just this sense of joy throughout them as well. There's hope even when things occasionally feel a little bit hopeless and also in some sad times it looks at how we can find the glimmers of the good there. Really loved it. Every story was great. Lots of you recommended me this. I'm really, really grateful you did because I thought it was brilliant. At 10, we have a classical myth retelling. Now, I love me a classical myth retelling, particularly Natalie Haynes. I'm a big fan of hers. However, me and mum have talked about this bit. My mum's a classicist. She also has a channel. I'll link it down below. She hasn't done a top books of the year so far yet. I'm going to ask her to because I'd like to know what they are. We were talking about how there's just a lot of them now, these classical myth retellings, and how it's becoming a bit saturated. This one bucks the trend and I thought was absolutely incredible. It's Clytemnestra by Costanza Cassati and this kind of takes the gods and monsters away from the myths and legends in which Clytemnestra is involved, which are quite a lot. Clytemnestra either gets into or knows a lot of what I guess we would know as the most famous myths and sort of almost has a hand in them or dips a toe in them, however you want to put it. So there's lovely references and riffs of all of those. So if you know a little bit, you're going to learn a lot more, but also if you know quite a few, you'll see them and that's really, really fabulously done. Also, this really... Because there's no gods and monsters, which is one of my favourite things in classical myths, actually. So at first I was a little bit worried. However, because this is so different, I really, really like that. And the fact that this is about this woman, this mythical, complex icon, as I would call her, and gives her such a voice, not always likeable, not always comfortable. Her story certainly isn't, but it's just so brilliantly done. And I can't wait for what Costanza writes next either. Also, check out the spreads on that one. There's some absolute corking spreading going on in 2023. Why did I call it that in 2023? This may be a surprise because I have struggled with this author before. However, I've had a Barbara breakthrough and I absolutely loved Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsol, but the lacuna I really, really struggled with. I tried to read it twice now. Anyway, spreads absolutely stunning. This was the women, blah, blah, blah. this was the Women's Prize winner this year. It's set in the 1990s during the opioid crisis in Appalachia or Appalachia. I'm not getting into that debate. I've had it in the comments. Barbara told me it was Appalachia so that's what I'm going with. It follows this character of Demon Copperhead whose narration is so incredible. At no point do you not believe the narrative in this book. And what I think Barbara does really brilliantly is, one, I love the 1990s setting. You've got Spice Girls and all sorts. I am a 90s teenager, and so that already really resonated with me. But also in telling what is a very difficult story about this young man, and telling the story of the people of Appalachia who are often dealt a very difficult hand and stereotyped, there's quite a lot of tricky, yeah, hard, content in here 
And I felt like just at the point where I was getting to the point where I was like, oh, this is getting a bit too much. It's like Barbara psychically knew and it would either throw in a new character that would be amazing. And all the characters in this are fantastic, even if they're just in it briefly and no matter how good or bad or in between they are, they're all amazing. But also there's this real intelligent sense of humour that knows just when to make a joke to lighten things, but also then enlightening things show how awful things are. And that's a really complex thing to do. But Barbara King Solver does it brilliantly. Yeah, I thought this was ace. And there will be a parallel reads video of me and my mum reading this. I just haven't got around to editing it because it is long. I've got a few long videos coming up soon. So I hope you don't mind a long one, as it were. When it comes to the end of the year, books of the year video, as I mentioned, I'm only having one book by an author. However, and this, I guess, would make this my current joint number nine, so cheating again possibly. I also read The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver this year, and I thought this was incredible. It's set in the Congo in the 1960s. It's told by a mother and her daughters who go with, well, their father slash her husband to the Congo. He's a minister, he's there to teach people the Christian way, and at first, it's like he believes he's been sent there as a missionary. However, we realise he's self-selected himself to do that. And this puts his family in very difficult and potentially treacherous circumstances. And I thought this was done so brilliantly. I loved the way that the mother's voice and all the four daughters' voices were so different from each other. It's just ace. So it's going to be hard at the end of the year to see which one of these will get into my top 10. I mean, that said, I may now go and read 20 amazing books that knock all of these off the top spots. And actually, I should mention that on my Patreon, every month in the beta readers tier, I do a top 10 of my year so far. And I think my Patreons are going to get a bit of a surprise later on. If you'd like to be a Patreon, it's really, really appreciated your support. However, I also understand things are very tight in the world right now, so I completely get it if you can't. Anyway, let's move on to number eight, which is another book that I haven't talked about on this channel until now, but will be in my May, June and July wrap up. It's Mrs S by Kay Patrick. Now, I was a little bit nervous about this one because I'd seen lovely Jen Campbell talk about this and she said that the sentences were really short and that's something that kind of bothers me. And when I started reading it, I was aware of it. Then I was also aware, hang on a minute, where's the dialogue? And then suddenly, 30, 40 pages later, I didn't care. It's about a woman who takes the role of matron at a boarding school where she meets the headmaster's wife and basically becomes kind of obsessed with her. I was going to say smitten, but there's much more depth and draw and desire to it than that, to be honest. And this book is salacious and steamy in parts. That may make you want to go out and buy it. And I wouldn't say don't, I'd say do. I shall say no more than that, but I love this. I guess it's got, I don't really know or do Dark Academia, but it has that vibe. Although the school setting often is a little bit secondary apart from there is a storyline involving some of the girls at the school that I won't spoil. But for me, this was really kind of a, almost like, it almost felt not quite like a monologue because there is dialogue and everything but it's just this one woman's version of events that we follow and we get quite embroiled with her and I can't wait to see what Kay Patrick writes next. There's quite a few debuts I think on this list. The next one is at number seven I believe yeah and that's Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks which was the book that when me and my mum filmed our shortlist to win a video on our predictions I wanted this to be my winner. I thought this was fantastic. It was a book I was a little bit nervous of because it's set in the dub reggae world, which is not something I know about. And very much like art, music is a subject in books I'm a little bit wary of because if I can't hear it, just like if I can't visualise art, I'm a bit like, mm -mm, this isn't working for me. This totally worked for me. I thought it was fantastic. We follow Yamai. And on one specific night when she's out clubbing, she meets a man called Moose and they start this incredible relationship and it's a wonderful love story, but not like in a gushy, awful way. Like it's it's real, if that's the right term. That love story comes to a sudden end for reasons I won't spoil. And we follow Yamaya as 
she then goes on basically a journey and we follow her to Bristol and then to Jamaica and the different parts of, well, pivotal points in history that she gets involved with as a black woman. So I guess it sings to Black Cake and also Girl, Woman, Other in that way. I ended up reading it physically and also listening to it on audio, which was great because she also got some of the music and that definitely added to the delight. But I just thought it was great. I have her short story collection to read in the second half of this year and I cannot wait because I think Jacqueline Brooks is going to be a favourite author of the future. Oh, I've got a little bit lost with my numbers. At number six, we have Ayabami Adebayo's A Spell of Good Things, which is a slow burner about two different young people who are in Lagos and they're living in very different lives. Eniola, who was from a very well-off family, however, his father has lost his job. That's a whole fascinating storyline that comes to the fore as you read on. Fascinating, but gut-wrenching and heartbreaking when you hear some statistics which I think are based on fact. Anyway, they have come into really hard times. They are literally sometimes picking up food off the floor in order to survive. And then we also meet Warola, who is um, from an upper-class family. She is uh, a medical student. She's in a very difficult relationship that she doesn't really want to be in. She's got quite a difficult relationship with her parents, but her family are all about stature and image and the expectations of what women should do in Nigerian society. And it's how these two characters' lives sort of follow, but interlink in ways they don't always know. And then it comes to this crescendo. I thought it was stunning. At number five, we have The Bandit Queens, which is a book that instantly makes me smile, even though it's got some very difficult subject matter within it. This is the story of Gita, who many believe in her local village killed her husband. And so she's kind of become this ostracised outsider. Kids describe her as a witch. The women that she's kind of in this money borrowing scheme with don't really want to be, but they have to be. And there's an odd relationship between her and her ex-best friend, Solani. However, as these women end up in quite difficult, tricky situations with their husbands, they think, hang on a minute, Gita got rid of hers. Maybe she could help us get rid of ours. And we follow on from there. And like I said, there's some really hard hitting stuff in here, but the way that Perini Shroff writes with such warmth and humor and compassion is absolutely incredible. I loved this book. I don't think I would have read it as soon as I did if it hadn't been on the Women's Prize long list. I would have loved this to be on the short list. It would have been my top three, that's for sure. I thought this was phenomenal and I'm so, 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 so glad I read it and I urge you all to too. It's actually reminded me of a series of thrillers that are also set in India and this, what I loved about this as well is it looks at society and cast and everything in India at the same time as everything else whilst also being this gripping yarn. But so does the series by Kishwar Desai. I read the first one I loved and then haven't got to the other two so I think I might might head to that quite soon. Anyway, at number four we have Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. Now this book has grown and grown and grown on me ever since I put it down. When I first read it, well, I should say it's another one that I wasn't sure about, like I wasn't 100% sure about the cover. I'm a little bit, or have been, a little bit wary about books around the troubles because it's such a complex thing I've never quite been able to get my head around it. However, last year I was working in Northern Ireland and I went on a trip around the North Irish coast to see like the Giant's Causeway and stuff. I say stuff because a lot of it was Game of Thrones as well. And I was like, I don't know what any of this is because I haven't watched it. The bus driver, who's also the tour guide, explained it in such an insightful and understandable way that I got it more and so that helped. But I think this book did that too. It's about a woman called Kushler. She's working at a school where the kids are having to learn the, the vocabulary in the news, which is pretty terrifying, which is a really poignant bit of this book. And like, just like a couple of lines like that, that are so poignant, those moments happen so frequently throughout this book. It's just incredible. And she's also working at a pub where she's met a man who's married, who she's having an affair with. She's got a complicated relationship with her mother and all of this is going on. So sometimes her personal life is right at the forefront for her with the troubles at the periphery. And then other times it switches. And I thought that was just done so brilliantly. I've also bought Louise's short stories to read in the second half of this year. And again, I think this author is going to become one of my favourite authors because her writing is just so brilliant. At number three we have 
another short story collection and this is The Dreaming by Andre Bagu. This is a collection of short stories told over various different time periods out in the Caribbean but what links them all is that well predominantly about gay men and how difficult this is for them and what I loved about this story that was also so poignant and also quite hard to read was that they would have these moments these men that were so beautiful and filled with love and passion and also it's a very sexy and steamy book but then those precious moments would be gone when they had to go back out into the real ones they leave their rooms and that's definitely something that lingers within this book there's a sort of almost like a melancholy I guess to it a bit um kind of bittersweet as well but I absolutely loved them one of my favorite ever short story collections this I just think it's amazing and I will just mention uh, with another cheat that I also really loved Narcissus by Andre Bagu and this is his latest poetry collection and this looks at the myth of Narcissus and how it's depicted in various different art forms brilliantly also looks about the love that dare not speak its name and secret love looks at family relationships looks at all sorts it's just phenomenal so yeah big fan I read Andre's essay collection I think it was Last year or the year before, I want to head back to that again because I think I rushed that one a bit and I really want to wallow in his words. So we're on to the top two and I think my patrons will be really surprised at this because this book has been number one consistently until June and then everything changed. This is The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, her debut about a young girl called Pecola who is treated horrifically by her family. Everyone calls her ugly. The kids at school are mean to her. And what Toni Morrison does with this book, which I think is so just incredible to be honest, is we follow this life of this girl who goes through so many horrible things. It's never gratuitously done, but we are definitely made to feel how awful her life is. But also we go through the people that surround her, be they her close family, including one particularly odious man who Toni Morrison doesn't sympathise or empathise with, but tries to explain why would end up the way they've ended up because of society and their life and everything they've been through. Doesn't excuse it, but just tries to explain it. But also some of the bystanders in Pakoda's life and looks at what it is to be a bystander. And that I thought was fabulously done. I had read Tony Morrison before. I read Home a few years ago, but I think it was, not a few years ago, actually, I think it was longer than that. I think we're talking maybe a decade ago. And I don't think I was the right reader or at the right point in my reading life to get it as much as I got this now. And so what I decided to do before I read this was to read all of Tony's books in order. And I will be heading to Sula at some point. I was going to read one a month, but the writing was so incredible in this. I don't want to rush her work and then not have it. Although I guess I could reread it, but I'm not a massive big reader. Rereader. Anyway, I thought this was absolutely phenomenal and what an incredible debut and it made me weep it made me yeah it's a tricky 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 read but an incredible one and then at the number one spot we have a book that was a complete surprise random purchase in gaze the word back in june i then read it later in the month it was that I decided to have it as the Patreon book club picks. I thought I'd quite like other people to read this with me. I was thinking I wanted something that was a bit of a summer gothic. And this book has just completely and utterly blown me away. I cannot wait to read more by this author. And I'm thrilled I've got a backlist of books to go. This was their debut and came out in 1996, but has recently been published as a vintage classic. I've done a whole video on it, which I'll link down below, but it is Serious Blooms at Night by Shani Mutu. And this tells the story of Marla, who when we first meet her has been put into kind of a care home because people believe she's gone insane but also people believe she has murdered someone and Tyler her nurse he takes her under his wing and through some gossip that he hears as well as mutterings that that when she's being coherent he takes on board but he also gets gossip from and I think it's such a fantastic name for a character cigarette smoking Nana I think that's just brilliant he sort of puts together her past actually even to before she was born and to her parents meeting and what happened and why her mother left her and her sister what happened after she left why Marla was so keen to protect her sister and a love story that almost was oh there's so much in here as well as this 
real brooding sense of dread because the atmosphere is so claustrophobic with this heat. And even when it's not hot, it's kind of got this feel to it. And also it sort of revels a bit in the, both the beauty of nature, but also the death and decay within nature. And is one of the most incredible books on gender I have ever read. I think it was way ahead of its time. I think the conversation around gender that this book has is so important now. And yeah, I just loved it. So without a doubt, it had to be my favourite book of the year so far. After I finished this book, I hugged it, I can feel it coming out, and I got really emotional and had a big cry, not just because of the emotional tension that had been built up so much in the book and the way that Shani Mutu leaves everything, but also just because I kind of just didn't want this book to ever end. I just thought it was utterly incredible. So there we go. Those are my books of the year so far. I would love to know in the comments down below what your top five books of the year have been so far. If you've got a channel and you've made this video, please link it down below. If you haven't, please go and do it. I would love, I would love to see it. But also if you don't have a channel or anything, just let me know your top five because then I'm sure there'll be many I want to go and find out more about and possibly add to my reading list for the rest of this year. If you've read any of the books that I've mentioned, let me know your thoughts on them. If you're now super duper keen to go and get them, tell me which ones and why. As always, thank you for spending time with me. It's lovely chatting with you and carrying on the conversation in the comments down below. If you'd like to find my Instagram, my threads, I'm so modern, Patreon, my wish list, my other channel, which I promise I will get around to sorting some content for soon. I've just been busy, but I've got pretty much the whole of August off, which I'm so excited about. We'll talk about that in a future video. In fact, I talk about that in my mid-year book chat video which I'll link down below if you missed it and thanks for joining me whether you've joined me for the last six months the last six years the last six minutes it's been really 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 lovely to have you all here and I'll see you in another video very very soon bye